Before the video starts, I'd like to ask if you could like, comment, and subscribe. It really helps out the channel and the algorithm. With that being said... Five Nights at Freddy's is a new horror film from Blumhouse Productions. It was directed by Emma Tammy and written by five different people. That's always a good sign. It's a feature film adaptation of the 2014 hit indie horror game of the same name. The game's premise is quite simple. Monitor the robots, keep them out, conserve power, and survive until 6am. The game brought to new heights the subgenre of YouTube Let's Play content where you fake your reaction to an audience of 10 year olds. Hey! What the fuck is that? What am I supposed to do? What am I doing? Okay, bye! The same game that spawned a franchise of unending sequels, prequels, and spin offs that hasn't shown any signs of slowing down anytime soon. No smaller is the dedicated fandom surrounding it with fanfics, theory and lore videos, artwork, OCs, animations and music sometimes reaching hundreds of millions of views on YouTube. If you want a more detailed breakdown of the long and storied history of this near decade running series, there's a good video by Jericho? called What Happened to Five Nights at Freddy's that goes very in-depth regarding the origins and current state of the franchise. So, when it comes to bringing Five Nights at Freddy's to life in the form of a live-action feature-length film, it's safe to say the task is monolithic in nature. Is this film up to the task? No. The Five Nights at Freddy's movie is a boring, tonally confused, tensionless mess. So lacking is it in any kind of atmosphere, I think climate scientists ought to study it for future generations. Most of what I have to say is spoiler related, so if you sincerely care about the spoilers for the Five Nights at Freddy's movie, skip to this point in the video. It should come as a surprise to absolutely no one that the only redeeming performance to come out of this two hours of key jangling is from Matthew Lillard, best known for Stu in the 1996 meta-horror thriller Scream. Every other performance in this rogues gallery of literally who nobodies and the guy from The Hunger Games range from the tolerable to the downright unwatchable. Josh Hutchison is mostly mediocre. Second to Lillard, he's arguably the most experienced of the bunch. His biggest problem is that he's totally underselling his lines. He's not given the best material to work with, but he's just so flat and wooden. Whether it's trauma dumping about his brother to white woman jump scare, or if he's talking to the creepy ghost kids in the Terrence Malick dream sequences. He's just not putting the emotion into his lines. His character doesn't feel like a person who existed before the movie started, or will continue to exist after the movie is over. A big part of what made the first game effective was its atmosphere, utilizing a combination of sound and the uncanny valley to create a feeling of isolation, helplessness, and the paranoia that something supernatural and unknowable is on the prowl. These presumably unstoppable monsters are hunting you, and your only strategy to pushing them back is to remain attentive to sound and visual cues. Another video that goes more in depth on this is How Audio Enhances the Horror of Five Nights at Freddy's by Scruffy. It's necessary to point out what worked so well in the first game because the film gets everything that worked totally wrong and in really critical ways. Giving the animatronics more emotive expressions really betrays that uncanny valley that made them so terrifying. In the game, their unsettling nature comes from their vacant, empty eyes, behind which there is nothing that can be rationalized or reasoned with just the empty stare of something almost alien in nature. Being given the addition of eyelids that allow them to squint and blink rips away part of that potential mystery they have. The glowing red eyes aren't just a really corny, overdone cliche. It actually does a disservice to creating genuine fear. Additionally, they're overly sluggish, moving at a glacial pace that anyone could evade with nothing more than a brisk strut. How are these fools scary when escape is so clearly within reach, unless a door arbitrarily decides to lock? There's a jarring and unexpected tonal shift about halfway into the film. Everything comes to a grinding halt to introduce a fun and lighthearted montage where our characters, including the animatronics, build a fort made of furniture from all around the restaurant, all while connection by Elastica plays over it. Nothing about it feels earned and seems to serve to just deflate any tension. What am I supposed to be feeling watching this? Am I supposed to be feeling a sense of dread because we already know what the animatronics are capable of? Am I supposed to sympathize with them in this moment and feel feel as if this is a genuine bonding moment for the group? Is it a mix of both? That question is actually answered later in the film, but my issue is that nothing about this scene implies anything and feels slapped with duct tape onto the film. Something that perfectly illuminates the laziness on display in this sad excuse of a film is the security camera footage. In the film, Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria is a derelict establishment shut down for decades. 
Vanessa states that the place was popular in the 80s, and the ancient, blocky monitors reflect that. However, for some reason the live feed doesn't. What we see is just footage filmed on a high-definition camera with a shitty VHS filter plastered over it. This hardware cannot display this resolution. What's more bizarre is that I know the filmmakers can make more authentic-looking, dated CCTV footage. On his first night, Mike watches an old Fazbear Entertainment training tape. And it looks so much better. It looks like real VHS footage. It's certainly not perfect. It still looks a bit too clean. But compared to this, the difference is night and day. The break-in scene is totally broken in a couple of ways. There's a subplot where the evil aunt wants custody of Mike's little sister, Abby, which is why Mike takes the night guard job in the first place. The aunt learns of his new job through the informant babysitter and elects to send her and her goons to trash the place in the hopes of getting Mike fired. My question is, why would a break-in to the establishment while he isn't working lead him to lose his job? If one of them had decided to, while he's there, lure him out and create a distraction as the rest of the gang attempt to influence trait from the back entrance or something similar to that? That would at least make sense, but this sequence of events doesn't logically follow. A does not lead to B here. Additionally, it doesn't really contribute much beyond the filmmakers forgetting that this is a horror film and there hasn't been much, well, horror. You could edit the whole sequence out and absolutely nothing is different. It's a total tangent from the rest of the film. The line when Afton says, I always come back, as he's dying from the suit's spring lock mechanisms, has no place being here. What is he referring to? At no point have we been shown something that would imply he's presumably come back from the dead? It's a totally out of place line there solely for the sake of pandering fan service. Earlier in the film, it's revealed that the suits are possessed by the ghosts of several children that vanished some time ago. This is something that was hinted at, but never outright stated in the first game. Later in the last third of the film, there's a reveal and Vanessa makes a confession that the suits aren't just haunted, but that the literal bodies of the missing children are stuffed inside. She explains that police searched every inch of the establishment, but never found them for this reason, stating that no one would think to look inside the animatronics. This doesn't make any sense. When bodies decay, they smell dreadful, and it's not a smell that fades after a few hours. It lingers and carries and permeates the room for days. Bodies also bleed. They'd be dripping everywhere, leaving stains on the suits and on the floor. This would also create a horrific and very noticeable smell. I've been fairly harsh on this film so far, so I'll list off some positives. It's a short list, but it's worth mentioning regardless. The models used in the film for Bonnie, Chica, Freddy and Foxy look really impressive. They've done a good job translating them from the original game into a live action setting. I like the Scream reference where Matthew Lillard's Afton in the Springtrap suit wipes a knife with his hand, like when his character Stu does the same thing in the Ghostface costume. I like this shot of Pirate's Cove. It's a clever visual for introducing Foxy into the scene. The biggest problem with this film is that it fundamentally doesn't know its own identity. It is both trying to be a Five Nights at Freddy's film, whilst at the same time it wants to take the basic elements that make the game and water them down enough that it can be labelled a very sanitised PG-13. However, it then almost solely relies on those elements for its scares. Imparting sympathetic emotions onto these automatons and turning the dynamic into one of friend versus foe could result in a compelling horror film, but in order for that to work, they'd have to be actually scary, which sadly, they are not. This indecisiveness leads to an ultimately very unfocused and just bizarre mess of a film. That's about it. I could spend hours picking the Five Nights at Freddy's movie apart, but to be perfectly honest, it isn't worth my time. So I think it'd be best if I leave it here. It's just a theory. 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 It's just a theory.